Was that the racing trip you did Sorry? when you decided not to race with your friends for that year because you got a better offer? So you had to drive to Germany all yes. by yourself and nobody <laughs> to to. So I sort of think that serves you yes, bloody I right. Know. I know. <laughs> but, then, but then one of us has got a car in the Porsche Museum with our name on the side of it and one of us hasn't. So I suppose that's, yeah, but then that, one there's an upside to it. <laughs> Keep going. Not that Keep racing, going. Though. Hello and welcome to episode 13 of the Collecting Addicts podcast. We have had a new name offered. It's rather good. It's called GOFTICS. That's an acronym. It stands for Grumpy Old Farts Talking Car Shit. I thought that was rather good, actually. So maybe it should be GOFTICS. It's very accurate. accurate. But being yeah. accurate. But for now, it's the Collecting Addicts podcast, episode 13. We're going straight in on the car of the moment, the BMW M2. It's something I'm quite passionate about. I've owned a couple. I think they're wonderful. It might be the sweet spot of M car for living in the UK. The new one, when it was first unveiled, looked to me mildly horrific. I've actually seen one in the flesh in the UK that was out being run in or or tested, and I thought it looked better than the photographs. Are we back in the zone where we think they look terrible to start with, and then in a year's time we're going to go, what's well, a good looking car? Over to you, Neil Clifford. Well, as we know, I always try to be positive about the future. I, I really struggle with this. The past is better. And someone said, Manish will tell me who said it, but I wrote it down, even though I don't know who said it. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. <laughs> I think it's Martin Luther King, maybe. I suppose my analogy is, we always think the new one maybe is not as cool as the old one until we get used to it. And I've made, I've made a little list. So F12 to TDF, not as pretty, the TDF. 1M to the 2M. 993 to 996. We were always very crit- – we, we hated yeah. the 996 yeah. when it came out, didn't we? Yeah. We adored the 993. Then 996 to 997, maybe you could argue we all were more comfortable quite early on on the 997 because it looked more like the 993, I suppose. E34 to E39, we weren't sure. We thought it was a bit fat and flabby, the E39. E30 to E36, E39 to E60 or 61. I never know whether it's 60 or 61. I think the 61 yeah, might the be the first mistake. bangle car. But we were all very negative on bangle, weren't we? We were Ooh, all like, oh, my yourself. God, this guy's speak fucking up BMW. So a 599 to F12, I think that was maybe an easier transition, actually, because F12 was better than 599. 355 to 360. I suppose my point is maybe we just always have to get used to the new thing and then we're okay. That would be my bit of thinking to throw out to the guys there because I haven't seen the new M2. I've watched all the YouTube and it does look a little bit of a Frankenstein compared to that last M2 that was very pretty. I know Chris had one. I watched that video about 100 times. Maybe it is better. We just got to get used to it. As ever, such a reasoned response, Neil. I, I hope that acts as a kind of an ointment to those that have got very upset by this issue. Chris Cooper, what have you got to say? I think it's inelegant. And I think Ooh. there's something about BMW right now which is not that elegant. That big electric bus thing that they've... the X, Is it the XM? Which was actually quite an interesting Citroen, but not a very it's interesting a hybrid. BMW. <clears throat> um, when I was in Sweden last year on the... I, it, is it a hybrid? Um, it's it's a, it is it's a, a monster, is what it is. So, uh, and I think it's just it's just inelegant. I, I think Neil makes a cogent. There's some good examples in there of where future and the next was definitely better, and it reminds us thinking that we are all grumpy old farts. We weren't. We're actually not grumpy. We we are all. I said last week, my favourite F1 race is the next one. I think we are all optimistic, very optimistic. Um, we have to and, be. And I think the, you know, the fact that they're still making a 2M or M2, whatever it is, is really, really positive. 
Personally, though, I do think it is a bit inelegant when other people are making elegant cars. And I do think BMW are caught in that. What are we making now? Are we no longer making cars because we've invested so much in electric mobility and that should look different? The i3, I thought was a beautiful, brilliant car when it first appeared. 10 Pretty. years ago? More Pretty than 10 car. years ago. Mm. Really interesting car because they deliberately chose to say, it can't just look like a car we've chucked an electric motor and a battery in. And it was deliberate. And the i8 as well, I thought was very elegant. Um, so BMW can do it. I personally liked the Bangal era, era cars. The first six series Bangal era car, I really liked that. The E60, I had a 530 diesel when they first came out. I thought it was a lovely, I see it now, I think it's just a lovely, pretty car. But this one, sorry. It got, a, it got a lot of negative reviews at the time, though. It Some was, and also like it. the E60 was launched without it was launched without a sports sports kit. The genius of Bangle was that every, he he upped the percentage of people that added sports kits to the to five series by about eighty percent because the car well, you couldn't look at it, it in SE spec. Him, but yeah, so I think BMW <laughs> can do it. Um, but this one, I mean, I've got. I mean, I won't. We'll, you'll, we'll show it on screen. I've just got last week's auto car with the front on. It no. It's gone back. <laughs> Manish, my... Manish, can you that, that sort of withering? Can, can you follow up from that withering? No, um, I may have to wither a bit because for me, if uh, if this was a Hollywood actor, it would be Danny DeVito discovering the gym in his midlife and steroids at the same time. That's what this car is. It's little and lumpy, and it's just. Ich, doesn't do it for me. They haven't grown on me. I have actually also, like Neil, watched you with a previous incarnation of this car probably a hundred times, the green version, mm. zipping around the track. You know, it's the most that, that that's the closest as I've I've been to falling in love with this car is watching you drive it very quickly. It's inherent aesthetics though. I'm with Mr. Cooper. Nah. Edward? Um one thing that's changed a lot over the years is that I loved reading Autocar. You, and you saw a few spy shots of these things. But when they launched it, they launched it yep. in a way they, they, they had control over the launch. And the first time you saw the images, they were shot perfectly. And pretty much all cars looked amazing when it was the first one coming. And, and now it's sort of teased out via social media, some spy shots the manufacturers always, for some reason, choose wacky and not in a good way, wacky colours to launch their cars, sort of gold. And BMW, had, had, I think they launched the X5 in some sort of sandy beige colour, which I always wonder. But that, that sort of powder blue M2 they launched it in, which the spy shots were terrible. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it looks good. I think it looks good. That was a really terrible way of explaining it, wasn't it? But <laughs> it went... a little contradictory, yes. Yeah. I, I, by the way, I did spec my, uh, I did spec my M2 out, Chris, uh, this morning just to have a look on the configurator, and these new cars still blow my mind. It's seventy three and a half thousand quid. <laughs> yeah, wow. that is that. That's a stat that. We have to, that makes you swallow hard. I think my M2 comp was forty two thousand when I bought it in uh, two thousand and twenty. So that's, yeah, that's just pretty much doubled in price. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I I just think that BMW yeah. is slightly stuck between a rock and a hard place because I I think it's trying to do to it's always trying to reinvent itself in slightly brutal ways. Uh, and it's the Bangle era showed that it could do that, you know, to get rid of the kink and, and to then go brutal. It worked for them. And they're, they're sort of trying to do it at the moment, but it's it, they're either going not far enough or they're going too far. I still think, actually, the big SUV, even though it's ridiculous, is a better statement for them because I think it, it just is so, fuck you, it sort of works for me. I, 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 and I can also see so many people that like that sort of shit. If you like an Urus... You're going to like the look of that thing, and that that kind yeah. of proves the concept. The M2 for me is is just well, we we are right to question whether this looks good or not, and I don't believe in doing so that we are being negative or being sour pusses like Neil says. Because when the E46 M3 came out, no one went, 
Oh, that doesn't look very good. Everyone just immediately mm. went, that's a lovely looking car. That's yeah, exactly that's true. Mm. So I don't, I think, you know, and I think that's, I think that's the way it works. The M2 is, it's an enigma though, because now what it is, it isn't an M2. It's a short wheelbase M3. It weighs over 1700 kilograms. Wow. And it, really? barely, it can barely seat four adults. It's a massive, it's, it's a, you know, it's less than 200 kilograms lighter than my M2 CS, my M5 CS. Which is, a, which is a car with 650 horsepower that's massive. So they've obviously got some lead in there somewhere. Um, I have to say, it's the first M2 I've not ordered because I, I still think it's pretty complicated looking. Yeah. And it's got 20-something inch wheels that are pretty much lost in those massive rear hips. So that the actual, the, the wheel wells at the rear are <laughs> enormous. I mean, it could take a 23-inch rim, I would have thought. I'm not going to say rim, sorry, wheel. Anyhow, moving on from our rant about the M2, which I'm sure is a great car to drive. Also, I'll add one other thing, because I feel like saying it at the moment, and that is that, as Chris pointed out, BMW is a bit confused between its electric message and its M department. I wrote a column about this, imagining the two sides of the BMW press office in Germany. There's the electric lot on one side that are all doing their thing, and then there's the poor sods that have to try and promote the M cars on the other side of the office. They are completely conflicted. But if BMW is spinning its electric message and yet it flies, it has to fly 20 journalists from Europe to, to Arizona to drive the new M car. I just don't, I feel so sorry for these companies. How, like how more mixed yeah. a message could you give yeah. out? Yeah. Um, doesn't mean I don't want, please keep making M cars BMW. But yeah, I, and I, please, I feel your pain. And we're, we're available um, to go to Arizona to drive it. Yes, of course, of course. Although once you've done one of those trips, I can assure you, you won't want to do it again. We'll do Moving on to too. a much more important issue. A much more important issue. The best looking car hi-fi. God, I'm, I'm, I'm agonized over this. So I'm going to tell you now, you're, it's open to anything that's in a car. It could be a base box. It could be an OEM hi-fi. It could be a, an old-fashioned head unit, singled in, doubled in. I don't care what. Um, I'm going to pass it over to you, Chris Cooper. So I'm going to start where Neil has often started with, I can't love the Japanese on this one. So one of my first jobs when I left <laughs> school... So when I first, some, I may have mentioned this before, I had dim desires to be a Formula One racing car designer. And when I got to Christmas of the first term of doing mechanical engineering and realized that I was pretty rubbish at it and it was a million years away, I went home. So I got a job in a quite posh hi-fi shop and they had uh, Japanese manufacturers hi-fi, which I loved, but they had their ranges of car hi-fis, which even then I thought looked no, they're all wrong. And now they look even worse, just really, really dated. So, and it kind of this is a danger this conversation dates all of us because younger people, even younger than us, looking at this now will think, what's a car hi fi? What's that, granddad? So, the ones that I think I do, the ones I've loved, I mean, we've all loved the Becker. So, I thought Becker was still German. It's not. Mm. Becker was bought by Harman. And Harman was bought by Samsung a few years ago. So it's effectively, so I've just contradicted myself by saying I don't like Japanese, given them, well, they're sort of Korean, I suppose, aren't they? So they're not Japanese. But um, <laughs> the Becker Mexico, that was a cool thing. And the Becker, oh, the Becker manufacturer stuff in Porsches was really, really just looked right. But if I had to buy one now, I don't know where you put it, but if you had to go and buy a car stereo now, I just think the Blaupunkt, Frankfurt or Bremen, it's just everything you want a car high fi okay. to look like. So right now, it would be the Blue Point, okay. Frankfurt or Bremen. Yeah. Okay, well, I think I think so. We, we've, we've already surfaced two of the great brands that are going to be getting Neil Clifford excited. I have to let him go now because he is... He's shaking his leg like a six-year-old that needs a piss. So, oh, yeah. Away you go, Neil. I've got the knee, trem <laughs> the knee trembler going on. <clears throat> well, I listed that. Unfortunately, Chris, <laughs> Toronto, Berlin, New York, yeah. Houston, Hamburg. And the best ones were always the German cities. Yeah. That's what the clever bastards at Blaupunk. You could have a Toronto fine. You could have a New York. You could have a London. The best ones were... Berlin, they were still Bremen and Hamburg. Yeah. And it was because it was all about the button count. <laughs> right? Yes. When you, when you saw that 635 CSI M power, 
you wanted to count how many buttons were in the whole of the fucking dash. And you could get up to 100, particularly if it was a four-door car. And the fact you could have Dolby C as well as B, you could have a metal button, you could have not just fader, obviously, but treble and bass, you could have loudness, you'd have the auto reverse button. You know, there were so many little buttons on that thing. And now they brought out, I think, the Frankfurt and the Bremen as reissue. They have. And we're all, you know, if we've got if we've got an 89 Porsche or a 928 or an E34 BMW, everyone's buying these things and sticking them back in. I've just bought a 560 SL R107, actually. And the first thing you do is put a Bremen in it because you've got the Bluetooth You've got the, you can play your DAB. Right. You've got a little charger, a little charger thing. Even though I think Blue Spot, Blau Punk is owned by some slightly shady thing now. It's not really a super cool German thing anymore. Isn't there still Robert Bosch? I think, you know, no, oh. it's not Bosch. Isn't they it? sold it in 07, I think. No, did they? Okay. I'm, afraid, I'm afraid the volume knob doesn't click the way it should. No. The volume knob doesn't go back with the click. No, it's not. But, but, you know, they've taken those redesigns and they've made them more practical. Um, so I would, I, would, I would agree, really. It's, it's uh, Blaupunkt. Okay. Yeah. And, and you, which one specifically? You're going to go for a Berlin? You're going to go for a Hamburg? I'll go Berlin. Yeah. With, Berlin. The optional, with the optional stalk that came off it? Well, the, the little radio stalk. Oh, yeah, the radio yeah. stalk, 100%. You know, um, I couldn't even find a photo of that this morning. But I've, the, I've, I've, the got, I've got one of the brochures, and I've, I honestly now, I still, I used to get so into this stuff that I, when I first saw a Berlin with the with the radio auxiliary stalk on it, yeah, seven three five I, yeah, I, I'm tumescent thinking about it. It was, it was a moment a I just love. Oh, what a thing! It's peak, yeah, it's peak um, stereo. Uh, Manish, what, do you, what, what car hi-fi do you lust after? Another one from our youths, I think. It was um, the BMW E24 reverse RDS by Blaupunkt. It was actually really simple. Orange, orangey red light, s- simple tape, but it had the one, little tiny one too. So it would actually just auto reverse yes. by pressing Ooh. two. Yes. And um, same thing, just a simple Dolby button tiny led screen on the right hand side and literally am fm i mean it was exa- the exact opposite with fewer buttons it's just fewer buttons two knobs bunch of buttons i've got a photo of it here i will uh make sure it gets posted but i have found something new that looks absolutely fantastic it's five years old and it is the sony rsx gs9 and it basically looks like a black Arcam separate unit. It's yes, just, I've seen it's that, just yeah. a beautiful black rectangle, big knob right in the middle. It's got a little USB, yeah, kind of original USB on the right. And it's just got literally, it's a DAB and it just connects your device. That's yeah, that's all I it saw does. that this morning. So pretty. It is actually quite Funny. cool. And then the last little mm. bit of lust, actually, I'd, I'd actually just like to buy one not for a car, but just to put it on my desk, is a 1970s Pioneer KP500. Oh, it's nice, that. Yeah. Oh, my days. I didn't know these things existed. So you didn't even have to fit them. You <laughs> buy a bracket and just stick it underneath your American yeah. car. And, the I mean, the eject button's the size of my head. The it's just one. got these three huge buttons, eject, mm. rewind, and fast forward. And what is the knob on? What, what's a dial on the right? It's as big as a Lamborghini speedometer. What is that dial? What is that dial? I'll have to look it up. It's well, just they often a... had two dials because they had the tuning, and then but the one behind it would be bass or treble or fade. So the, this has got a move. treble, bass, and balance, a volume, a tune. No, but I mean by dial, I mean I mean it literally is a big rotary thing, and it goes up to a hundred and something. And it literally the other great thing is it's got a stereo and mono button. How cool is that? I just love it. I'm, I'm getting I'm, one. I'm looking. I'm looking that up straight away. Um, uh, Edward, what are you going to go for? Well, I, I was struggling with this, but <clears throat> now I've got quite a few. And uh, so I think the best story is the McLaren F1 Kenwood, 
uh, mm. the weight, which yeah. you can go back and listen to the podcast that we did on that one. I just think that's just a wonderful story. Yeah, that's um, true. A, a yeah. modern speaker, which was is the Bang & Olufsen tweeters raising out of the dashboards. I just think that's just such a brilliant design cue. I think they did them on Audis and Aston Martins, where they raised out of the dash. Um, yeah, they popped and then up. I, I th there was when they um, launched the Ferrari sixteen M. Um, not many people chose this. They most people missed the five spoke wheels for some reason. I don't think they were available originally, but the car looks so much better with those wheels. But also, you could just choose to have the stereo replaced with an iPod, and you literally just place the iPod in the middle of the, um, the uh, in the middle of the dash where the stereo would go and actually as the design piece that's all that's all you need needed and then you just press the button and the iPod um, pops out um, but my final answer is different to all of them which was the, my probably first memory of driving something and realizing you didn't need any sound system which was a Verde Silverstone with Coyo 355 GTS which came in in part exchange against a 993 turbo at Porsche Center Swindon and I went and visited mm. my uncle who lived up on the Marlborough Downs and I called him about 500 meters from his house and said stand outside the front door and and listen to this <laughs> and had had the roof off the 355 GTS and just opened it up down the hill that's better than any sound system in a car. There oh, we go. God, I yeah. think that's true. I think the option of no stereo is a super niche and super cool decision, isn't it? If you're ordering a new car and you get that stereo delete thing, yeah. like a CSL M3. I think that's a nice spec now. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the purists might love it, but I, in, in practical terms, it's yeah. just the wrong thing. Um, there's a very there's a very uh, well known press car that's a nine ninety seven three point eight RS with the number plate eight BY that Porsche GP loved. Hebe. I did yeah. the first eight thousand miles in Hebe because I drove it because I was, I was doing some racing at the Nurburgring with Porsche, and that was my way of getting to and from Germany. I went there four times in three months, and um, it had no hi fi in it. And this was before you know iPods really worked that well, and and there was no streaming. It was an absolute nightmare. It had no aircon and no radio. It was devious. But I love the car. But I I really I love tunes in the car. They're the most important thing. Was that you, the if you're worrying thing? about the weight of a high was that the racing trip you did Sorry? where you decided not to race with your friends for that year because you got a better offer? So you had to drive to Germany all yes. by yourself and nobody <laughs> to to. So I sort of think that serves you yes. bloody right. I know. <laughs> but, then, but then one of us has got a car in the Porsche Museum with our name on the side of it and one of us hasn't. So I suppose that, yeah, but then that one there's an upside to it. Other one. <laughs> Keep going. Keep going. Word. And, uh, anyhow, anyhow, uh, moving on to car high fives. I think um, th this is such a pet subject for me. The Becker I get, the the Blaupunks I get. I think moving a little bit later on, Blaupunk went off the boil, I think, early 90s. It did. When they started yeah. doing the button quality reduced. There yeah. was something about when you pressed the button on the Toronto and the little red light came on in the middle. You know, there was some German that spent his life working on the action of that button, and it was all undone in the early nineties. They went for different finishes. They they were really confusing. Tiny. They yeah. weren't as good. Yeah. But then it became between Kenwood and Alpine, and um, and I was just I loved Alpine car high fi So I disagree with Chris. I think some of the Japanese stuff was the best. Nakamichi made some fantastic head units, uh, and even now the the tape players themselves are of the very highest quality. They're, they're superb. But there is one particular model of Alpine that if you can find one, I look for them the whole time when I'm drunk. It's called the 7618R, okay? Yeah. It is the single finest head unit ever made. Nothing comes close. Anyone tells you there is a better one, there isn't. For, for, for the, the quality of radio reception you get and tape playback, it was astonishing. It really was. And I had one, and I transferred it from car to car to car to car to car. And I just... I love it dearly. I, I, if I, I've seen cars for sale, this and this touches on a subject we're going to come on in a minute. I've seen cars for sale, and it's made me think I might buy the car because it's got that head unit in it. 
it really is a thing of joy. And you could turn the colour between grey and sorry, between green and orange, depending on whether, yeah. whether you had those lights in your car. Is it the so, one with the big source button? Um, no, it just had no. a just had a normal button, and it just the rest of it was just push buttons. But it was, and it was so high quality as well. They were. I, I, I feel I feel sad that the younger generations don't have these things to geek over because it was another way of personalising your car, wasn't it? it? Was. You could yeah. put your own yeah. head, you know, you were stamping your own personal statement on your car. Now you just get the OEM hi-fi, most yeah. of which are extraordinary sounding. You know, if you've sat in a S63 coupe with the Burmester in it, it's, it's a, there's nothing I've ever heard yeah. like it. It's outrageous, yeah. but it doesn't look as cool in the dashboard. Right. Do you remember? Do you remember the film Nine and a Half Weeks? Kim mm-hmm. Basinger and Mickey Rourke. Yep. So he plays this currency trader with infinite amounts of money who lives, I can't remember where he lives. He lives, you know, downtown in that great loft apartment. So just before he has his first wicked way with her in his minimalist apartment with identical suits, he, he's playing Brian Eno on uh, Music for Airports, in fact, on his Nakamishi tape deck. And I think to slightly impress her, he reverses it and presses the button. The front of the tape deck comes out. It actually physically turns the tape 180 degrees and goes back in. No, that, for cool. me, was sexier than any sex. It, it was a Nakamushi movie. dragon, wasn't it? The dragon, the dragon still is the one. Dragon. I bought, the dragon. I bought a dragon. I bought yeah. a dragon 10 years ago. I'll bore you with this. I bought a dragon. This, is, this, is, this will make you weep or make you laugh. I bought a dragon 10 years ago because my late father had a collection of tapes classical music tapes that and that's what he loved that he used to play in his car and my mother had put them in the in the loft and I thought what lovely way to make myself look as interesting and as clever as managed would be to get these tapes out and start to learn about classical music because I used to listen to it with my father but I sort of gave up on it too early so I bought the Nakamichi dragon and I confidently went around to the old dear and I said right I'm getting those tapes out and she went oh, after away <laughs> <laughs> so I so I had a dragon for about two months. I flogged it on eBay again because I had no oh, use for it. So yeah, you know, the dragon. Happy, <laughs> story, happy story for this recording day. Um, <laughs> now this next one is not meant to offend any of the manufacturers involved in making these products. This is just a personal position, and I and I could have my mind changed, and that doesn't mean it's a pitch for you to send me your gear. It is this: Should dedicated driving shoes be made illegal? Neil Clifford, I bet you've got a few. Um, look, I have, I, have a, I have a particular interest that no shoe should be made illegal. <laughs> In fact, it should be right. made legal that you buy as many shoes as possible. <laughs> That's, if, if, if we're talking about shoe laws, I think it's about most people should have more pairs of shoes than they currently do. I think the average pair of shoes Shoes bought in the UK is two a year by men and five by women. And I think we could increase our country's GDP if we improve that by a significant number. <laughs> now, the driving shoe, I could bore you with a whole podcast on the driving shoe. I think that the, the specific driving shoe of the Pilotti or the, or the Sparco Puma, I think they're all quite difficult to pull off. I do. I have to admit to own the red Puma, Sparkle, no. but I don't wear them. I, th- I think God. it's quite a tricky, you've really got to be, I don't know, a world champion rally driver to pull it off. I think if, you, if you're rocking up at Vista Heritage Scramble in a pair of Pilotis or Sparkos, I think it's, it's a tough look. <laughs> of course, if you, if you do the Targa Florio like I did and come last with a big smile on your face and you wear your classically handmade Cecchio shoes, then it's a different matter. But the, the the driving shoe of the 90s or even the 2000s was the Todd's Loafer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right? Now, I, it was then uh, overtaken completely by this trend of wearing sneakers everywhere and not buying anything else if you're a man. The loafer is coming back. And I think that's a very positive for people like me that, you know, sells a lot of shoes as part of his job. So the loafer, the Todd's loafer, which is super chic, um, a bit Steve McQueeny, really, or in fact, the car shoe, which is a brand owned by another big Italian company, I won't mention. The car shoe is a very chic little loafer. Oh, so if you're going to do driving shoes 
and you don't want to wear a sneaker, get yourself a pair of car shoe or a pair of Todd's. But please, let's not make any shoes illegal, Chris. Okay, I'm sorry about that, Neil. Um, and I, I understand your best interest. That was actually I just I just without realizing that's obviously your level, your area of expertise. You've just broken it down for us. Manish, how do you want to follow that? Um, so I did actually many years ago own a pair of Todd's loafers, and um, I can absolutely vouch for what Neil said that it's the little grippy bits on the heel. You can just yeah, rest your smart. feet. I am wearing a pair. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So the ones I had had those, you know, the little dots on the heel that just just went round the corner. They're called they were, the Gamino. The Gamino. Just the most be- They were the most beautifully comfortable shoe. But um, and I agree, probably shouldn't be made illegal. But I have to say, when researching this, I found that video of Senna driving the NSX yeah. around mm. oh, Suzuka, okay. and they had a camera there. in the footwell. Yeah, and he was wearing a pair of burgundy loafers, but without the penny, without the, you know, the what, what do you call that bit where you put the, the, the pen, that sort of T-bar? Because they were just completely the plain. But, but they, they were completely plain, so they had no sort of bar. They just had literally the, the top stitch. Very, yeah, very low. Yeah, a little John Lobb loafer now does that, yeah. Well, so he basically had these with fabulous white socks, because that's what people, I guess, in the late 80s and early 90s, and it's just a magical lesson in heel and toeing. You see him do it. And he doesn't do it like that. No angle. His foot's actually practically vertical. So he's yes. kind of touching both pedals with Mox. either side of his foot. But the best bit is when he comes out of slow corners like the um, hairpin, where he's going, da, 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 da. so I think, Ordinary. you know, if Senna was around now and he was walking around a pair of burgundy loafers without the penny bit in them, white socks and half mast jeans, I think he'd still look cool. So we won't. I think Senna can wear it. He could do it in a pair of Hunter Wellies, though, couldn't he? And he'd be fine. Yeah, he do you know what I mean? Could, yeah. Well, I, th- yeah. I think the more unlikely the footwear, the cooler it would be, isn't it? Yeah, Chris, uh, Chris Cooper. So uh, I'm, I'm sort of where I think you're coming from, Mr. H, behind the question, although I agree no shoes should be made illegal. Um, the question raised in my mind is, do you mean shoes for driving? Because driving shoes suggest shoes for driving. And the, the, the difficulty, and there are lots of things to do with cars that potentially fall into this trap. People who turn up or drive to track days with their race suit on, that's sort of in this category. So a shoe for driving if you're just driving your automatic family car, you could drive in any shoes. You don't need a shoe for that. I think what is meant by driving shoes or a shoe for driving is when you're going to get on a bit, you're going to make a bit more progress. And yes, if it's a three-pedal car, because not all three-pedal cars these days, manual gearbox cars, the pedals aren't necessarily positioned for heel and toe. Mm. And the brake pedals can be too soft, so you can't use the brake pedal as a fulcrum to blip the throttle. Um I still think wearing a racing boot or something that is trying to pretend to be a racing boot is a bit pretentious. And I think some of those yeah, loafers definitely. with they had those little rubber bobbly bits on the side of the right foot where you would rock your right foot off the brake pedal onto the throttle and little rubbly bobbly bits would make sure you grip the throttle pedal. That's all just trying too hard. So, you know, if I was, you know, I've, I've been on these track days and these Johns and Palmer days. And I suppose you'd make it a bit of a point of don't take your racing boots. Take a pair of Converse shoes or or Daps, Dunlop, all-purpose shoes. People, are we old enough? We mustn't remember that. Daps, one of you at school used to have to little white thing you have to paint them with. A Dap, Dunlop, all-purpose shoe. So like a green flash. We call them plimsolls in the old days. So a Converse shoe. I got loads of Converse. Converse is the best shoe because you can stick them in the washing. Sorry, Neil. Other shoes are available. Um... Converse, you can stick them in the washing machine. They come out looking like brand new. It's brilliant. You can have a brand new pair of Converse every day. So I would wear just for – and something like a catering where there's not much room in the bottom of the foot pedal. You need a small, narrow, thinner shoe. You couldn't wear trainers or sneakers. It's all about the narrowness. You're right, yeah. I think it is, yeah. So um, I wouldn't make driving shoes illegal. What I would do is to say if you feel tempted to wear a driving shoe – be, be prepared for the sort of the silent 
but but significant judgment going on in the minds of people who would watch this podcast, for example. <laughs> that, was, uh, that, was the, that, was, that was the nicest <laughs> kick in the nuts I've ever heard. Uh, I've been well, I'm not sure. Edward, can... Edward's probably wearing a pair of Valencia Lager, whatever, fucking platforms at the moment. What do you think? They're just shoes. Um, there we go. I'm not sure. What One thing I definitely don't want to do is what, by the time I get to the car to start driving it, is to want to, to change shoes. So it's the choice of shoe you leave the house and in the morning needs to just work. Um, I need to be very careful. I don't offend anyone here, but hopping out of a 360 Moderna with a... Scuderia Ferrari hat on and shirt on and a pair of poorly fitting jeans and some red Sparkos on. I might be walking the opposite direction. Um, apart from that, all <laughs> shoes are allowed. <laughs> do, do visit Harrods or Selfridges to buy your shoes. I think um, I've got to be very careful here. I don't mean to. I think anyone should be able to wear anything they want. And I look like stick of the dump most of the time. Um, but I, I suppose I've always had a slight aversion to the dedicated driving shoe because I, I find the presentation of that garment to other people quite tricky. I don't know what it says about you. Yeah. It could actually say really nice things. It could say that you care about your driving, that you love the fact that you can combine your passion with something that's sartorial. I like all that, but I suppose maybe the reason why I find them a bit icky is that I haven't, maybe I haven't got the confidence to wear them myself. That might be it. Um, but I also, I think there's something glorious about happening across a product that wasn't intended to work for something that does happen to work for something. You know, we've all got little cheats in our lives. They used to be called cheats. They're now called life hacks, which is a phrase I find <laughs> quite tricky. Um, but I think one of the greatest life hacks of my life is finding stuff that works in cars. You know, finding a chocolate bar that fits in a particular cup holder that you like in your favourite car. Finding a, a space in a car where your mobile telephone used to fit perfectly. All of these things. And I think also finding a driving, a car, a shoe that did everything for me. And I found it about 20 years ago. It's made by Onitsuka Tiger and it's called the Ultimate 81. They don't make many anymore, sadly. But it had a rolled heel. It was narrow enough to be able to fit in the foot whatever well, cater room, but you could stand around in a photo shoot and your foot wouldn't get cold in, in winter. It just did everything mm -hmm. to the point where I now, I must have bought uh, 50, 100 pairs or something in my life. I still have a 20 pairs left because every time I see one on eBay, I buy some. So I, but the dedicated driving shoe, I've just always struggled with it because I don't, maybe it comes down to the fact that I haven't got the bollocks to, to wear a pair. I don't know what it is. I look at them sometimes and I think they, they're Pilates, Pilates shoes. Yep. They look nice. They're, they're yeah. not unattractive. Yeah, they do look nice. Yeah. yeah. But I suppose it's the, it's the, I think racing gear belongs at the racetrack. Race yeah. garments belong at the racetrack. Yeah. Like the one, the one group of people that would not wear a pair of racing boots away from a circuit is the professional racing driver. They leave it there. Yeah. They, they all, you know, Sebastian Loeb, the moment he was out of the rally car would be probably put on a pair of loafers. You know, that's what he would do. And I believe that Senna as well. You know, that's the reason why it's such a strong statement. And Senna in the, in the seminal NSXR video is that, that is, that's, that's a statement. He's saying, I'm not wearing racing boots because I'm not in a Formula One car. Therefore, I don't need to be wearing racing boots. And the other, the other video that for me totally supports that is Stefan Rosa in the, in the yellow bird. At the Nurburgring, yeah, exactly. with the loafers, with the, with the again the white socks, less defined, but it's the white sock, the toweling sock in the loafer. That video, okay, this defines it. That video would not be as cool if he was wearing a dedicated driving shoe, would it? Yeah, it would lose something. Yeah, I, yeah. I suppose it's easier for racers though to make that decision. If you yeah. if you aren't a racer yeah. and you you know you haven't got your odds, you're not doing good wood, but you just want to be part of the world of racing yeah. maybe the access is the racing boot yeah okay and i, I was and I, I i posed the question not because i have a massive allergic reaction to it yeah. i don't want to offend people but i just it's just something i i've never quite understood and i yeah, now understand I racing, I, this I is like right, therapy isn't it you're right neil i think you know um track days are you know, they, they continue to be really really popular and more and more people want to go on them 
And it's clearly a very sensible thing to do to have the right kind of footwear when you're driving a road car or something like that on a track day. And a racing boot would be really, really sensible to have. Nobody would sort of sniff at that. And you might even pop out on the petrol station way back as a forward, still wearing that, thinking, I don't want to pay another, put, take another pair of shoes with you, rattling around in the boot when I'm blasting around Silverstone. It's the, 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 the driving shoe that Monkey and I, I guess, are sort of talking about is that, that confection of a manufacturer that tries to draw in the unwary or the, the uninitiated, say, somehow, if you don't buy this, you're not really a proper enthusiast and enjoying a car. No, that's, that's bollocks, really. So you can really, really enjoy your car. I think the coolest guy for me in a, in a racing boot is Walter Roll. That there's a video of him, I think, within the his his uh, whatever you call it, left foot braking, right foot braking. I'm shit at all of that. But that little the little video of Walter yeah. Roll driving the Audi r- rally car is yeah. just the most magnificent piece yeah. of skill. And I think he's wearing a racing boot in that. Not he probably. Over. I think I would. Yeah, that's, to do that's, that. um, that, but that's in the middle of a stage so, uh, in Portugal. So I don't think he could have been wearing a low boot. <laughs> I bloody hope not. Um, <laughs> yeah, what, right, yeah. we're going to move on. Um, here's a good one. I think. What's the most embarrassing reason you've ever had for buying a car? I'm going to start with Manish here because I think he's probably bought fewer cars than the rest of us. But there's still going to be an embarrassing reason. Um, so actually this involves my daddy. Um, my, I had a stepmother. I actually had three stepmothers by the end of it, but my first, wow. stepmother, um, she, a whole podcast she was wonderful. She was into. a pediatrician. Well, you know, the, the therapy podcast. Um, so I, uh, she, she was lovely, really lovely pediatrician and, um, my father and she had a practice in California and, um, for a woman who really loved cars, and she really loved cars. In fact, she said when the marriage to my dad ended, I remember her saying, when he and I came out to California, after we'd done our kind of, you know, retraining and our American exams and all the rest of it, I had a choice of investing in a practice with your father or buying a Berlinetta boxer, and I made the big mistake of investing in a practice with your father, which is... <laughs> Anyway, the point is she bought a 1978 Datsun and I cannot remember what it was. I just remember 120Y. So yeah. yeah. it could it could well have been on 20Y. So it's Southern California, you know, they've got this. And she would not change this car. And I remember this car, you know, my dad had a, a Mercedes 300 turbo diesel, and I remember she had this Datsun. They'd go to the press, and this thing just became sunburned. It was just so horrible and my father became so embarrassed of this car she went i remember this summer holiday she went to india for a two-week holiday and when uh, she left he said right we're buying her a car because i can't see that datsun in our drive or in our garage or in at the practice ever again so we went to bmw of riverside i think he got me to sit in various cars and he bought her. Do you remember the E28 5 Series? Nice. Got a 535 i you know, with all the buttons. 535? Yeah. It was gorgeous. It really was. It was um, deep metallic green. It had black leather inside, had all the buttons. And then I remember the day she was flying back, he just parked the car where her old car would be. She came back from the airport. She was picked up at the airport. She looked at it, the fight that ensued. She was like, how can you spend this money on this car? What is it? Absolutely went mad. Then she sat in it. And she literally put some Wagner, I remember, into the tape deck. And she didn't move. It was the car was sitting there idling on the drive with the air conditioning because it was a warm Californian day, windows up just doing this and you could see her going oh i could get used to this we could never get her out of the car after that so i remember it was she had That's the magic. most embarrassing blue datsun and then she had the most beautiful bmw 535i 1986 Mwah. well we know where you, we know where you get your taste from then manish yeah. chris cooper what's what's the most embarrassing reason why you bought a car then so um we, we live on a small farm 
and my boys were born and grew up here. And when they were growing up, we had sort of little off-road go-kart, and that was quite good fun, and they sort of spit around the fields and that and so forth. And then we had the, the farm has a Kawasaki mule. It's one of these off-road all-terrain vehicles, the diesel engine, limited to 28 miles an hour, road, road legal, um, but not very fast. And when the boys were getting sort of 15, 16, um, I thought, well, we could have a faster ATV, couldn't we? So um, there's a local dealer down the road that sells these Polaris ATV things. They're quite fast. Got about 100 and something horsepower. So uh, the local dealer said, why don't I bring one up for you one Saturday morning when the boy, when boys were here? So I said, that's a great idea. So we went out and did skids and stuff. It's, it, it felt quite tall, a bit tippy, but it said, no, no, it's fine. It won't roll over. We'll come back to that. So I thought, and Cameron said to me, um, Dad, can I have a try? I said, oh, great. I said, you know, in years to come, we'll look back on this as one of those bonding moments between father and son when I taught him the joy of oversteering and countersteer and look where you want to go rather than where the thing is pointing. And all that. So I remember I might have said to him, go faster. And we went on a bit of a jump, a bit of a sort of a tip in, in the sort of track in this farm. And it just got, you know, even the passenger seat in a, in a thing that I wasn't really, I could just tell it's gone too far. And he got the lock on, but it just, that thing when all new drivers do, didn't get off fast enough. So went back the other way and it rolled and it rolled. In fact, it rolled quite oh. badly. I, how we weren't hurt, I don't know. Um, so I knew we were in trouble. So I went back to the farm and I said to Cameron, when we get in there and we talk to your mum, say nothing, I'll do all the talking. And she said, I went in and said, look, we need one of the forklifts. Why do you need a forklift? Don't ask. Why do you need a forklift? So because we just rolled that thing. And she said, you mean that thing you haven't, we haven't paid for? It's just a test thing. So we had to buy it because we damaged it. <laughs> so the most embarrassing you reason you buy I've, it. That's the rule. You, you the most it, embarrassing you buy reason it. I've ever had <laughs> is because I broke, I yeah. crashed it, I rolled it even before the wrapping was off the thing. So, um, so yeah, be advised. <laughs> if you bend it, you buy it. Neil Clifford, no, we've only got another four hours. Sorry. So just keep it short. <clears throat> Anyone that knows me well knows that quite a number of the cars that I own now I've owned more than once. <laughs> <laughs> and it's getting to it's getting it's very, very true. It's getting to the point where actually a, a few of them I've bought three times the same car. But I've got a little story on one of those cars, which is a um, and and give me an opportunity to express my love of Bristol's. I know Chris is a man of Bristol's, or maybe Bristol. Just to confirm, but, this is the car, yes. not the appendage, right? This, yeah. this, this is the car, and uh, there's a there's a and, and actually Ed's father is a massive love lover of Bristol's, isn't he? It. He is, and this is—we all know that this is my passion. And I own this Bristol Four Eleven for the first time, which I paid fifty-five grand from. For beautiful car, jersey, jersey from new, concourse winning, light blue, tan leather. As always with Bristol's, there was a story: a man died, or got murdered in it, or whatever, or <laughs> you know, flew Concorde, or whatever it is. Anyway. When you own one of these cars, you don't actually drive it that much because you do tend to just drive from one petrol station to another because it's 6.3 litres um, uh, particular. So I sold it. And, of course, then two years later, I bought it back for 55 grand for exactly the same price. And then I didn't drive it. for, And then I sold it. And then, then I was reading a book. And this book is by L.J.K. Setright. Oh, and Ed, we, we, we can do a, a podcast on him. He's one of the coolest, one could say, slightly stranger car journalists. If he's not Elvis, he's Paul McCartney of car journalism. You know, he's up there as being the king, really. And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this little quote, because this little quote in the book, and it's the most beautiful book, is why I then went and bought the car for the third time, just by for fifty five grand, of course, always the same price. Um, let me just read it to you. This was the explanation and dis, and and 
and visualization of Bristol. After the war, when Bristol came a car company from being a fighter um, war plane company, the idea has always been to produce a car of exceptional equilibrium, unquestionably a driver's car, itself a matter of balance. It needs to inspire the faith of its passengers, but be a gentleman's car, although not offend people who are not gentlemen. A seriously fast car, it must be intrinsically safe, therefore an engineer's car. It must not be wanting in art or any refinements in luxury. In all its qualities, it must be an exercise of complementaries, not compromises. Oh, fucking brilliant. I read that and I thought I've got to buy the 411 again. <laughs> you know, I could have just go and buy the car. I went and bought the car for the third time. And I still don't drive it because it does like four to the gallon. <laughs> Brilliant. That's the Brilliant. reason why I bought the same car. I'll tell you what, I wouldn't want anyone to follow that other than Edward Lovett, who's probably got another equally ridiculous reason why he bought a car. <laughs> well, no, Chris, you did this, uh, you wrote this down, so I want to hear yours. Um, okay. Uh, I've got, I've got, well, I touched on one earlier. I bought a 205 XS once because I like the head unit in it. I didn't need another 205 XS. I already had three, but this one had an Alpine head unit in it. And I just thought I can't, I don't think the owner of this car is going to separate head unit from car. So I just better buy the car. And I, but I just wanted the the hi-fi. That was utterly ridiculous, but I did. I think my most, I think the most embarrassing reason for buying a car was a car I still own which is a W124 Mercedes 320 Sportline cab. Nice. Uh, which I haven't driven in years. And I bought it for £16,000 from a well-known Mercedes specialist. Um, and uh, I think I've spent 35000 on it over to keep it on the road since 2006. I don't drive it. And I think in the trade, it's probably worth eight. Um, so one of my friends has a spreadsheet on how much money I've spent on it. Uh, and sends it to me once a year because they find it so funny. Anyhow, Super cars, though. This, it's a it's a it's a car I always wanted. The four is the last great four seat Mercedes. The Sport line, yeah. And it's the worst investment anyone can ever make because they haven't gone up. It, it, haven't. The equivalent of the fifty five thousand pound Bristol, they're always sixteen grand. They're never going anywhere, even though they're rather lovely cars. So anyhow, this specialist, remain nameless, uh, is situated between Goodwood and um, Bristol. So I'm doing some work at the Festival of Speed in 2006. And I think to myself, I'm gonna, I've am gonna. i spoken to them about this car. I'm going to go and test drive it. So I go to test drive it. And I have to get a taxi from Goodwood to where their place is. It's a 100 quid taxi, which at the time I didn't have to spend on a taxi. So I get there. And it's the end of the day. And the bloke doesn't really want to talk to me. And he's not, he's not that keen to sell it. And I go for a drive in it. And it's got a fair amount of the Christmas trees coming off on the dashboard. You know, I've got three or four lights on. When I press the brake pedal, she's juddering. The steering wheel wood's all cracked. The leather's... It's not the car that's described in the advert. And then I think to myself, I'm fucking tired. I want to just go home. And the only way I'm getting home in time is if I buy this car. <laughs> so I did... So I, did I, gave him, I gave him the money on the spot and I just drove it home. And I remember as it got home, it pretty much shit itself. There was smoke <laughs> coming out of it. And I did it because I because I, I did it because Uber didn't exist. And it was utterly shameful. And I wasn't wealthy enough to make that kind of rash decision. And everyone around me was angry and laughed or laughed at me. And it was just shameful. I just, I did it for convenience. And I bet, I bet you've bloody done it, Neil Clifford. I bet you've done that where you've gone, I'm here now, I better buy it. Yeah, yeah, I've got I, another story for another day on that. I've done that one, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it was um, it was it was embarrassing, and I've still got the bloody thing, and I don't drive it because I've got an R one two nine, which is infinitely yeah. nice and car. Yeah, never... right, Edward, what's yours? Well, I, I've I've probably saved myself from embarrassment on quite a few occasions when buying cars because when you went well for for me personally, when you if you travel around the world going to some of these different car events where there are auctions, you sort of feel like you've taking yourself halfway around the world to California to go to Pebble Beach where there's, you know, all the best cars are being auctioned over the weekend. You think, I've got to come back to the UK with something. And not on most occasions, I've bought 
bought one or two cars and have luckily got out of them. I think I pretty much left all of them over there and left them with a local dealer and sold them. But there could have been some very embarrassing stories because I was fortunate enough to be underbidders on many of them, which I would be underwater, as I think is the terminology you would use today in the in the trade. But the my most embarrassing story, I didn't have a driving license. My parents had allowed a few of my friends to come over from school and they'd been very kind. My mum had been very kind and she'd bought us some Alco Pops to drink. So they left us at home very irresponsibly and they went to the opening of a new golf club or something along the lines. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun if we went right to the back of the alcohol cupboard where they keep the strong stuff, where no, no one wants to drink? So we decided to get stuck into that. My sister was away in Ibiza or something like that. And her Nissan Micra was on the drive and I knew where the keys were. So I thought I'd show off to my friends how fast I was down the drop, down the gravel driveway. And we have these some of the, these small trees that are planted alongside the drive. And I think I got to about the sixth one, lost control, stuffed the car into the tree, put my mate halfway through the windscreen and got ourselves back to the house, not with the car. The car was definitely a write-off. Called, called the golf club to say, could you find my parents <laughs> and, um, and in, <laughs> inform, inform them that I had had this accident? Uh, and about half an hour later, they got home. I was quite impressed to see my father pick up the whole side of a uh, Nissan Micra by himself to correct it before the uh, the towaway truck <laughs> got home <laughs> to pick it up. So. Um, that was at the beginning of the summer holidays. I spent the rest of the summer holidays cleaning cars, mowing lawns, doing whatever I had to do. And I had to do the proceeding for the next three summers until I'd paid off the four and a half thousand pounds for the <laughs> Nissan Micra. So I never owned the car, but I paid, paid for it. <laughs> I think we need to add there that we don't endorse any of that behaviour, yeah. but if you're an Edward effing lover, you'd, pro you'd probably get away with it. We, we weren't on the public Outrageous. road. Though. We weren't on the public road. No, no, you weren't. You weren't absolutely fine. No, all fair in love and war. Um, uh, <laughs> next subject. She says, taking a deep breath. Um, and this, this might not go on too long. It's might just be an observation by me. I, I was really impressed by the British GT race at the weekend. Um, I watched uh, quite a bit of it. I had... Uh, my friend Alex West was was racing and uh, congratulations on his podium in the second race but I just thought, I normally think big GT cars in the UK on small UG, small UK circuits don't work Alton's very narrow in places but there was some great driving skill on display, there were some really big names and it's just the mixed conditions added to it. Now those cars are going to be at Le Mans next year so that the, they're getting rid of GT well GTE effectively but they're going to have um, GT3 cars at Le Mans and I think it's a great idea it's going to open it up and, I, and I, I leave this out there and I'll put it to Manish. For me, Formula One cars can look like Formula One cars. They don't have to look like the cars that the makers sell. They never have done. Ferrari F1 cars are Ferrari F1 cars. But I think sports cars should look a bit like stuff that car makers sell. I really do. And I think, therefore, Le Mans should be populated by Ferraris that look like Ferraris, not LMDHs and stuff like that, which all look the same to me. What do you think? T totally agree. Weirdly, um, I thought Formula E had missed that exact trick. If you had a bunch of silhouettes on a platform that looked like Lamborghinis, Ferraris, um, whatever's, you know, BMW, Mercedes, it, my son would watch that. You would you'd combine kind of, you know, green sort of electric car credentials with things that just look like souped up versions of what you see on the street. And all I would say is about just the GT3s at Le Mans, it's sort of in a way bringing back an old tradition anyway. You know, the idea that you do have such a mixed pack working... I mean, all racing their own races. Um, but w w one thing I would say, though, is um, I was lucky enough to do a film with Tom Christensen a few years ago, and he got to tell his story. And when I first went to meet Tom, I went to his house um, on Tom Christensen Road. And um, he's, he has a lovely car collection, not, not too many in the house, but it's kind of part of his garage. And um, 
he has his very last Le Mans winning Audi in there. And he said, do you want to sit in it? And I went, really? And he said, yep, sure. Opened it up. So it's a bit of a thing to get into this thing. And I, I couldn't believe in a way how prehistoric it was, you know, toggle switches, that kind of thing. But when I was sitting in there so low with the windscreen, like a fighter jet, quite, quite far away from me, he said, do you know what it's like driving this thing at night at 350 kilometers an hour? He said, I'll tell you the hardest part I find when it comes to really driving at Le Mans. He said, the speed differential between us and the lower, lower classes is so great sometimes 100 kilometers an hour and he said but yeah. what people don't understand is it's not like formula one you can't wait till you get to the corner and then get the guy after the corner or in the next corner he said the steep speed differential between us and some of the lower formulae could be 10 12 seconds a lap you could lose four seconds five seconds if you let him get into that corner so the imperative it's just to keep overtaking, keep overtaking. Yeah. And that would be my only teeny tiny worry about a huge swarm of GT3 cars with these massive beasts on exactly the same track. You know, are these people going to see the big beasts, especially at night, and just get out of the way and stay in their own races? So, That's my only teeny tiny caveat. So there had to be a change. So uh, many of you listening will know that, I mean, there mm. are those this year at Le Mans, there will be the, as Chris has said, these GTE cars they used to be called GT2, and they look the same as they pretty much look the same as GT3 cars. And for the last four, five, six, seven or eight years, there's been a debate going on in the sport and with manufacturers as to why we got both. The basic differences are the GT3 cars are less sophisticated, got a bit more power, less aero, less sophisticated suspension. GT3 cars now from a manufacturer cost about half a million quid. They're quite expensive. A GTE car, GT2, is going to be over a million. And the numbers have been getting lower and lower and lower because there are fewer and fewer teams or individuals who could fork out and run these cars. So there had to be a coming together of categories. So GT2, GTE, has basically gone. And GT3, which British GT Championship runs, lots of national and regional championships have run, has now appeared. Um, you kind of think that, isn't it all getting slower? But it isn't. So I've just, I did a little bit of Googling this morning with my son Cameron and looked back at the last 20 odd years at Le Mans. So, because there have always been the speed differential. So go back to 98, uh, the last year, I think, when the McLaren F1 GT car, it was a GT1 car. So GT1 was the original GT category, going back 20, 25 years. So that pole time was a three minutes 50. Following year, uh, sorry, 2010, roll through 10 years, the Aston Martin DBR9, its pole time is a 3.55, so a little bit slower. Tracks change a bit, but I don't get much. Roll forward to now, so last year, the pole time in GTE, not Michael Fassbender, if those who've watched it probably worked out it wasn't him, was a 3.47, so faster than McLaren F1 went 20 plus years ago. The GT3 cars, I think, will be faster still because they'll just turn the wick up a bit. Uh, the good news is there are lots of teams who run them. Lots of drivers who understand them. Big difference to the cars is the GTE cars mm. have no anti-lock brakes, no traction control. Um, the GT3 cars have traction control, have anti-lock brakes, which is why the AMs can drive them in the wet and so forth. It makes it a bit more accessible. So I think it's generally a good thing. Um, it will be interesting to see whether LMP2 survives or whether the hypercars and the Le Mans hybrids and GTs will basically be the one. So... On balance, I think it's a good thing. Uh, I totally agree with Chris. I think for me, it's partly about shapes. I just want, I just want to see cars that look like cars. I want to see Ferraris, like Ferraris, Lamborghinis, like Lamborghinis. And GT3 has always been. It's just a fantastic marketing zone for those car makers. And the fact they've stuck by it and invested so much money in the last yeah, fifteen yeah. years. In, you know, Stefan Rattel deserves a huge amount of credit for what he's the sport he's built there with all these national championships. Yeah. Um, and I'm excited by the idea. There's always been big speed differences. And I, 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 I get Manish's point when he's talking about Tom Massive, Wilson, who was yeah. you know, the greatest of them all. But surely the art of being a great endurance driver in a fast car is not tripping over back markers. And I think that the, the difficulty of the sport is that there's now enormous pressure 
on young drivers to, to get through traffic quickly. That's where you make the difference. You don't make the difference in the pits. You make the difference exactly. in the traffic, which is yeah. the most dangerous place to do it. And obviously, that has that's created some massive, really difficult shunts. I mean, that one that Alan McNish had was just enormous. And you just think, as someone who raced, you know, I just thought to, I just thought to myself, why? Why couldn't you just wait a corner? The answer is, if he'd waited a corner, he'd have lost three seconds. Yeah. And the team would have been on the radio going, Control, why did you GT lose three car. seconds? So, you know, it's, I think being an endurance... Yeah, it was, um, it was really, really tricky. I mean, so, Le, Mans, Le Mans is the best motoring of Yeah, but it was like the, the first world. hour or two of the race. From 89. Yeah. So sort of yeah. Jag win, Mercedes... Great. McLaren F1, GT1 Porsche, Peugeot, the whole Porsche era, the Audi era, the Bentley thing. I mean, there's nothing better than midnight or even 5 a.m. is even better, actually, at Arnage with your mates, seeing the big bollocks that those guys have doing that. You know, I've, I've slept in my car, I've camped, I've... Posh hotels, shit hotels. I've had a jar of honey thrown in the window of my 205 GTI. Yep. Um, I've been arrested. I mean, everything goes on. What's got goes on in Le Mans stays at Le Mans, but it's fantastic. And this year I'm going twice. So you've got the 100 year, the proper event, and the classic, which, you know, is because of COVID, it's happened last year and this year. So I'll be there in mid June and then yep. end of June. It's fabulous. It is. And, and also, uh, it should be noted, even though part of it's public highway, it is, a, and it, people think it's just a sort of a, a series of long, long straights. It's a circuit with real rhythm. If you're privileged enough to drive it, because it isn't open as a circuit outside of those two events, it's brilliant. It's just gorgeous to drive. It actually, even in a slow car, it's it's gorgeous to drive. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's a fantastic move to have GT3 back there, mm, largely because I, we'll get to sit. You know, in LMDH, it's all about you know, Chevrolet versus Porsche versus Ferrari. But I don't think that the Porsche looks like a Porsche. I don't think the Ferrari looks like a Ferrari. And they just no. look like sort of they, silhouette. Well, they, they sort look of like the look, silhouette of that, a prototype yeah, to me. That's the problem with LMP2. They all look exactly the same, whereas the GTs clearly will continue to look different. So I think, yeah, it's bring it on. Yeah. And if you want to go with Ferrari, it's only £200,000 for a ticket. Yeah, that's that's got, subject. We'll talk got, about that another day. Yeah, yeah exactly. What's it's only two hundred grand. Yeah, it's called, what's the club called? Hypercar Club or something, isn't it? Rich Blokes Club, I think. Yeah, but yeah, two hundred yeah. grand. I think it's for two years, so yeah. it's only a hundred okay. grand a year to get a ticket. Yeah. What's a Le Mans? Uh, what, sorry, Las Vegas. There's a five million dollar suite <laughs> for um, for the Grand Prix. I yeah. mean, a five million dollar suite. Apparently, you know. You Come get on, food we'll thrown it. in. You, you know, there are some bedrooms for five million yeah. bucks. That's nice. Yeah. Apparently, it hasn't got a trackside view, has it, Manish? That's no, no, no. That's <laughs> no, that's like those poor kids. They're the bunch of kids who bought tickets for 500 each and they found out they were going to be watching it some, from some kind of viewing area with no actual track view. So that's they're going to go to Las Vegas, the equivalent of Henman Hill, you know, but for $500. Um, I think. Uh, on that note, we, 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 we're getting quite long now in terms of timing, so I'm going to move on to the two-car garage. But is that, is that okay for everyone? A man with a rally affliction has come into some money by way of inheritance. Despite spending days in Welsh forests since the late 1970s watching his heroes, he's never owned anything more than a two-litre Mondeo, but now he has £60,000 to buy an everyday diesel wagon and something to remind him of the sport he loves. Okay, Welsh boy, Neil Clifford. I'm a quarter Welsh, actually. Are you? From um, Splot in Cardiff. Are you? Yes. Mm. I've spent many a 70s evening listening to the trains full of coal going at the back of the house. Um, <laughs> anyway, I spent a lot of my time thinking about the diesel wagon here, and I'll explain why in a moment. And I've discovered this car that didn't exist. There's only 22 of them which is the Audi Q7 V12 TDI. There's a video I did online somewhere. I've never heard of this car because I knew what I was going to choose and it was embarrassing as the rally car. So I thought, what's the coolest diesel car I can buy? A V12 yeah. TDI Q7 Audi, 18995 on Auto Trader, one of 22. Sadly, in bloody black were black as they always were. 
But nevertheless, that's quite a cool diesel wagon because my embarrassing statement on the rally car is I couldn't I couldn't choose anything else about, apart from the car that I've got and the car that I've got is Japanese. So I've had, even though I'm always talking about my dislike of Japanese car, I've gone Japanese, which is the Subaru Impreza, Litchfield, T25 for 30 grand. The engine will probably blow up. I'm told that engine was so ridiculously highly tuned by Litchfield. If you get 5,000 miles out of it without it going tits up, you'll be very lucky. But you debadge it, it's in the right blue, and then you're Colin McRae or Richard Burns. Fantastic. Licho, don't bloody sue me for him saying that, all right? Because I know you've got two of my wagons up there at the moment. I don't want you leaving messy protests in the boots after that. 425 horsepower. It's, I think it's a five-star Evo car, which obviously from a bog reading perspective is where you go. Yeah, and it's probably, the, for me, apart from the 22B, is the coolest Impreza. Um, Chris Cooper, what are you spending your money on? So uh, I think we've got to help this guy. So um, rallying is uh, under a lot of pressure in the UK now because it's harder to get permission to use forests and you've got to pay more to have them done afterwards and um, not so many people volunteering. So rallying, rallying's a bit under a bit of pressure. And I think if you were watching in the Welsh valleys and the woods and the forests and apologies to those in the northwest of Grisdale or Kielder or Scottish, but, but there's something about Welsh rally. And I think this guy would have seen the best of it in the 70s, 80s, 90s. So it's got to be two wheel drive. For me because that's what this person would have grown up in and i think you'd end up with i mean it's a road car you know we'd all love to go and get a mark ii or even a mark one rally car escort but you can't really use that on the road so i've gone for on behalf of our welsh friend talbot sunbeam lotus uh, and i think you could just about persuade those nice people at tolman <laughs> who more recently have been seen with that beautifully restored Resto modded 205 Peugeot. Before that, they did a Talbot Sunbeam Lotus and a few magazines a few years ago, they were running this. So a really nice Talbot Sunbeam Lotus now is about 35 grand. I reckon with a bit of Tolman love and a bit bit more power, a bit more, you'd probably end up, uh, what's the budget again, 60? Yeah. 60. So I think you'd end up spending 59,500 on a beautiful <laughs> Tolman with some Lotus, and with another 500 quid, I get a VW Passat PD100 diesel from the bloke down the road. <laughs> yep, that's so what I do for my I wife. Friend. Totally agree. I've driven that Tolman thing by the way, it's stunning. Yeah, They've it's lovely. Super duper one with 250 horsepower. Got it. Yeah, so, I just think he'd, um, he'd love that. He'd love that. He would. Cool. Uh, Ed would love it. Um, well, we, well I've, I've spent sixty thousand pounds on the nose, and we sold uh, an interesting car quite early on with collecting cars, which was a nineteen eighty one Audi Quattro. You can find it in the um, sold section, and it was a works prepared express car that they used, which then went on to be converted and heavily um, competed. And there was a US driver called um, John. Bumpf. Do we know who that is? Buff, Buff, Buffum. Is Buffum? that a name that rings a bell? John Buffum. John Buffum yeah. Who's yeah. the only US yeah, driver yeah, good, to good have peddler. ever won yeah. a European Rally Championship uh, event? Um, anyway, we sold that car for forty-four thousand wow. pounds. Um, it's got a, quite a long and interesting history. Go and have a read. Um, and then for an estate car, I think I'd have a three-three-five diesel BMW estate. Which I found a nice one on Auto Trader, and that's my sixty thousand pounds spent. Nice. Wow! Surprise, surprisingly pragmatic and sensible for you, EFL. Normally, you're all over the place, but I like that you're, you're showing signs of consensus. Uh, Manish. I did think about an Audi Quattro, but actually, for me, the sexiest one I would have to get a Lancia Delta HF Integrale Tipo One Three One. Forty-five thousand pounds, red. It would be beautiful. You'd get something absolutely gorgeous for that. Now, that's just something about the way that car looks. It was the dominant. It was a Group A, wasn't it, back in the day? Group A and then Group um, A, yeah. It's a win every single year. It's just, it's so pretty, so pretty. I think. Send me the link on that. I'll buy it if it's forty-five grand. <laughs> I don't. Well, I'll try to find you the link. It was just the most beautiful car. It's bright, bright, just so pretty, and um, uh, but. 
Is that scepticism, Mr. Clifford? Did I, oh, I think what he's I saying is, he's, he's been, I tell you what, man, she's being a nerd. What he's what he's quietly trying to say is, there's no way there's an Evo for that money. No, so it's probably an eight valve or a sixteen valve. But I, still I think, think it's it probably is. Better looking. Yo, yo, I think it is an eight valve. Actually, you're eight probably valve. right. It's not an Evo. Yeah. It's eight valve. But that you know, it's his dream to be a rally driver, and he gets yep. in play like that. That's what he does. You know, he plays and then valve. I would probably get exactly that for the remaining ten, fifteen thousand pounds or whatever. I'd probably get an Audi A6 Avant with a few miles mm, of diesel, mm. three liters, never break down, bit dull, bit love it, but you know. <laughs> Lovely. I actually okay. saved 10 grand because he's going to get 10 grand worth of dri- driving shoes. <laughs> <laughs> he's not, he's the last person who's going to buy that. Yeah, he does. He's wear, he wears well he's, when he's bobble hatting. Right. So, um, I know this guy better than you because obviously he exists in my mind. And I know for a fact something that you don't know. And that is that he's a massive fan of Terry Cabey. Terry Cabey is one yeah. of he's just a lovely oh. man who is a he's a genius rally driver, uh UK rally driver who who could have he was so close to being a you know a big world name. But if you go on to YouTube and you look at the 1982 Welsh rally sprint, a brilliant event. Go and watch these videos. They took a side of a mountain and they used to go up to the top, and then they'd get timed and then they'd come back down again. And that was it. It went on telly. You used to get Murray Walker commentating, and it was... Yeah. It, I mean, If you could recreate a new event, if we could do Collecting Cars' best ever driving event, Edward, it would be to go up a Welsh hill and come back down again. It was Stig Longquist versus Russell Brooks versus Pentia yeah. Rickler, all the names. But Terry KB, 82, in a Chevette, is pulling angles that should be on Strictly. <laughs> Honestly, just sensational, aggressive driving, and the Chevette would be pulling a wheel up here. It's so much rear compression that it's it's like a Labrador wagon. It's yeah. fucking poor at you. It's just the, the 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 look of this car, the stance of this car is captivating. So for me, I've watched that and I've gone, I've got to have a Chevette HSR 2,300 yeah, cool. cc's. And I've found one for £45,000 and it's my dream. And at that point, I think you will have the same sentiment. I don't really give two shits what my road car is because I've got a Chevette. I don't, I've got, I've got yeah, a Chevette about. Yep. in the garage. And I've thought to myself, but actually I still want a rally connection to my diesel estate car. And there was a quirky car made by Subaru many years ago. They made a flat four diesel estate car. So they actually made, I mean, it's a really interesting engine and it was actually really quite good to drive. So he's found himself a Scooby-Doo which is diesel and it's an estate car and it's got horizontally nice. closed engine, which is nice, interesting, which just refers back. And he, do you know what? He's a happy man now. And by the way, go and watch those videos and go and celebrate They're Terry Cabey because he could drive yeah. that thing like it was on fire. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. As is traditional, we're going to finish uh, with a musical choice. Edward Lovett, what's your musical choice for this Texas week? Texas Sun by Leon Bridges. tune there we go short to the point chris cooper well our our rally buying man would have propaganda duel the theme to top gear round report remember in the 80s yeah. and 90s yeah good shout, oh, it's amazing. Amazing. shout. Great, it's propaganda. great shout propaganda go, go and look that up if you haven't heard it already it's Trevor Horn again. Uh, Trevor uh, Horn. Manish. What's it going to be? Was was Brahms into rallying? Did he like an escort mark too? Mm, <laughs> yet I. <laughs> this, this isn't a rallying connection, but I actually thought the Jimi Hendrix version of "All Along the Watchtower," going oh, back to good. our with Nail and I days. And remember those words, scrubber, oh. scrubber. They love it. Go on, throw yourself <laughs> into the road, darling. It's just great. Yes, <laughs> did a nice cover of that as well, didn't they? With the wrecking ball just going straight into right. that side. All this hideousness. Oh, all this hideousness. <laughs> They're throwing themselves into the road. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Neil Clifford, what's your tune going to be? Oh, I think I think the car is the only acceptable place, unless you're in a choir, that you sing. Yep. And ideally on your own, because I have no voice for anyone else to listen and therefore my album is Out of Time by R.E.M. I can sing every song, every word, probably wrongly. If you go on Spotify and get the lyrics, it'll all be incorrect, but it doesn't matter. And there's a, there's a song in there called Texicana, which I didn't know was a place until I was going to Little Rock, Arkansas in November last year, and I missed my connection from Dallas into Little Rock. 
and I had to get a seven hour taxi from to, to from from Texas to uh, Arkansas. And I went through fucking Texicana. <laughs> and I'm like, I just thought it was a song. It's a place. It was fate. So, it was fate. So, uh, it, yeah, Texicana, R.E.M., out of time. And we should all sing in the car. And it's uh, it's a great thing to do. Um, I, was, I was with my youngest in the car uh, last week. And we were talking about great intros to songs. So, you know, that, 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 whether, whether you get hooked in or whether just the first few bars of music just make you remind you of something and how powerful that can be. Um, and, I, and he said, what's your favourite? And I just thought, hard question to answer. And then I, and then I put on Dakota by the Stereophonics. Mm. And, I, and it just mm. always just, just sends a bit of electricity down my spine. So go and listen to Dakota by the Stereophonics and just how beautifully produced it is. If you've got a good car hi-fi, like a Blaupunkt Berlin or an Alpine 7618R. I love the way we just bring this back beautifully. The circle of <laughs> um, Please go and enjoy it. Uh, uh, huge thanks uh, to uh, my fellow um, podcastists uh, today, Edward Lovett, Manish Pandey, Chris Cooper, Neil Clifford. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Go and uh, go and have a, a listen to more music. Have a great week, and I hopefully we'll have some F1 very soon. Bye-bye.